In this video, I take out all the welders I own. We go through each of them one by one. I tell you my thoughts, and this time I did my research. Okay. Today we have an interesting video concept for you. We have pulled out every welder that exists, well at least that I own here at Lift Arc. There's even three or four more behind the camera. But we've gotten some interest from people, our viewers and patrons, to like do a welder roundup. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna do a welder roundup. I'm gonna go over not only how I feel about and how I use all the welders here, but like the actual technical specs and like how they stack up against each other, what corners of fabrication and welding they serve the best. Drawbacks, features, nice to haves, raw power, serviceability, warranty, all that stuff. We're just going to start cheap and end expensive and uh, go through them as they are. But it's been kind of fun to put everything out on the table. Not only has it helped me realize what I have, I don't know, if you're a welder, this is kind of like welder nerd stuff. Like, look at all my welders. Some of which I use all the time, some of which have been collecting dust for a little while, some of which I've never used. So let's get into it. I came up with nine categories, which I will evaluate all these welders on. Everything from just brand and model, the processes they do, price, whether if it's an older welder, what it sold for originally, and if there's a modern comp, what it sells for now, or what I actually paid for it. Power, amperage, rated thickness of metal it can weld, Duty cycle, we'll be covering duty cycle, what that means, why it's kind of mysterious and weird. Complexity, learning curve, serviceability, features slash nice to haves, and then my overall feeling and conclusion about each welder. I did some real homework here for you guys, okay? I'm a college dropout, so this was really hard for me. <laughs> Before we get started, some of these welders were given to me, some of them I purchased, however, even the ones that were given to me, I did not really sign anything saying I have to be nice to it, I can't rip it apart. I'm gonna give my honest opinion about all these welders because I am legally allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> quick shout out, not to delay the point further, but quick shout out to all of our patrons. We have started to have some really cool conversations on Patreon and therefore the Discord server. So if you wanna get more involved in the channel, definitely check that out. Everything from $5 a month to $15 a month goes from just general support and early YouTube video release to behind the scenes stuff and direct interaction with yours truly for whatever that's worth. So there you go. It's worth about five to $15. <laughs> and also the two Vivor welders, we do have affiliate links for. I think we've made Vivor like five grand based on selling this welder. So our video of this welder comparison to the Everlast actually made it onto Vivor's product page on their website. It's like the first, you see it on the site before the product information. We've made Vivor a lot of money. Yeah. And if we're allowed to disclose it, we've made them dollars. Yes. Peddling Chinese welders. Who knew that's what I was doing for a living? I'd like to stop doing that. Miller, if you'd like to have a conversation, I'm ready to uh, grow up. <laughs> anyway, let's get into it. The first welder, going from sort of cheapest and most basic to whatever the opposite of that is. So this little guy right here, this is the Vivor MMA 200. It's a stick welder and a plastic welder and apparently a lift arc TIG welder, although it did not come with TIG hardware. It does not have a gas input. So it's gonna be a lot like this old Miller where you have the gas valve on the TIG torch. You gotta get your own regulator, super basic. This thing costs $111.99 on vivor.com, making it the absolute cheapest welder that I own. It'll do 120 amps on 110 volt power, so it's multi-voltage, it'll run off 110, 220, or 200 amps on 220 volts, allegedly. So there's a caveat I'd like to insert here about cheaper welders and claimed amperage ratings. I would bet my car and my house on the fact that this will not stay at 200 amps. I can promise you that. It's sort of a common trend with 
cheaper welders. Even if it might do it, it would do it very briefly as the duty cycles uh, at 200 amps, even if it gets there, is only 30%. They also claim it'll weld 0.8 inches or 7 eighths almost on, with multiple passes, which isn't really how you talk about that. Normally the single pass number is the one you talk about. You can kind of weld anything if you can do enough passes. We've covered this in the Welder Reacts video before. Link to that up here. So duty cycle, I'm talking about duty cycle with all these machines. What is duty cycle? The best that I could tell, duty cycle is judged on a 10 minute window. And a duty cycle is, it can operate at X amperage for a certain percentage of that 10 minute window. So in this case, for this machine, they claim the duty cycle is 30% at 200 amps, 60% at 142 amps, and 100% at 110 amps. Duty cycle also depends on if it's a multi-voltage welder, you'll have different duty cycles for the different input powers that you use. So apparently this will operate at three minutes at full tilt before you need to cool down. And I believe, Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe if it's a 30% duty cycle, that means you need to let it rest for seven minutes, like three minutes on, seven minutes off of that 10 minute window. I'm not, not gonna correct you. I'm pretty sure that's what that means. So you need to let it rest for the other side of that percentage. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I researched this for nine welders over the past two days and they all kept saying the same thing. Miller actually has a really nice breakdown on their website of what duty cycle means. Complexity and learning curve. I'd say this is a very simple interface. Uh, you do though need to learn what arc force and hot start mean. Those are two stick welding proprietary terms. Arc force is also considered dig. That has to do with penetration and the profile of the weld. Whereas hot start is a feature on some stick welders where when you first strike the arc, it turns the amperage up automatically in order to establish the arc. Anyone who's stick welded knows that sometimes getting it started takes a little bit of effort. You gotta peck at it maybe, or it gets stuck. So hot start, if this does in fact have it, will start hotter than your set, your, the setting you've dialed in and then it'll come back down to what you've set it at in order to establish that arc. So for a $110 welder, pretty nice feature to have. I would say stick welding as a practice is the hardest part of the learning curve for this machine. The interface is super easy and if you know how to stick weld, then this welder is uh, pretty easy and we have stick welded with this. Cut to that video where we reviewed it. Plastic welding is easy and pretty self-explanatory. It's This is the only welder that welds plastic and really it's not welding plastic, it's heating up metal curls and burning them into and across a crack in plastic to bridge it back together. Hot stapling is more accurate. Plastic welding would insinuate you're kind of going along the crack like a weld. In any case, that is a cool thing to have and I think that is what this welder is gonna serve the shop waiting in the wings. Luckily, it doesn't take up much space. So if I have to fix plastic in an extravagant way, that's what this welder will be used for. Serviceability, no parts for sale, claimed 30 day returns and a claimed 12 month warranty. These things are disposable. Let's face it. No welding shop is gonna give you more than 30 seconds of their time when it comes to repairing these things. Most guys will not have even heard of Vivor welders, probably. So when it breaks, you can try to get a return or a replacement, but if we're being honest, you're probably gonna have to throw it away and buy a new one. Planned obsolescence, everybody. Features and nice to haves, it's extremely light. The plastic welding feature is pretty cool and stick welding is the most portable kind. You don't have to carry around a gas bottle, just two leads and a power source and you can weld anywhere. Stick welding is also pretty good for wind resistance. So it's a great mobile, outdoor welding process. My feeling, it's cheap, it's simple, it's handy, and it's basically disposable. All right, next welder in the LiftArc Studios welder roundup is the Vivor TIG 210P. It is a stick welder, it is a DC TIG welder, and apparently it has a clean function, but no, no hardware or parts came for that, so. Who knows? I've only just seen this on social media, but cleaning is like, it's sort of like an electrolysis or electro, like there would be a brush that's electrified that maybe you 
put a chemical on and you brush it over your weld and it like cleans it. You know how stainless welds will look rainbowy. Apparently that cleans, I've only ever seen it really used in stainless welding, but it'll, it'll clean it and maybe sterilize it again after the welding process. I don't know what that means. I don't really care. Uh, it's not relevant to my existence as a metal fabricator, but I was just reading you what was on the box. This one sells right now for $205.99. It will run off of 110 and 220. Has an amperage range of 10 amps to 210 amps and apparently it'll weld up to quarter inch steel in single pass. I doubt for very long, but theoretically it can. The duty cycle is 30% at full tilt, 200 amps. The complexity and learning curve. Very simple interface, you do need to know how to TIG weld. That's kind of a given for all of these, like complexity. I'm trying to more talk about the machine itself with the understanding that you know how to TIG weld already or do the certain process that the machine has. You do need to know what 2T and 4T triggering is with a TIG. You do need to know what pulse means and what that entails. And it does not come with a gas regulator. So there will be some added complexity trying to source a regulator, which if you go to a welding store and buy a Smith or Miller or Victor regulator, you're probably gonna spend more than you spent on the machine. I was at Harbor Freight, Vivor themselves probably sell a gas regulator, so if you go cheap on a welder, go cheap on a regulator. <laughs> you heard it here first. You heard it here first. What's 2T and 4T triggering, since this is the first one that brings it up? 2T triggering is the arc is struck while holding the trigger, and when you let go, it stops. 4T triggering is you press and then release the trigger, the arc stays on until you press and release the trigger again. So 2T means you, there's two clicks on the trigger, on and off, and 4T is four. So if you're doing a long weld, you can click it in, let it ride, and then click it off. Pulsing is the welder's ability to turn the arc on and off, or more rather, up and down at a set frequency, a set power range limit in order to establish, really the, the function is to control heat input into the part. I like that it somewhat automates and gives you like almost a metronome to follow when you're doing sensitive welding. I use it on roll cage work all the time because heat control is really important and you don't have the luxury of a foot pedal. So dialing in a really nice pulse allows you to operate on your back upside down without a foot pedal and be really good about heat input into the part. There's other reasons to use pulse, but that's my favorite parts about it. Serviceability, uh, no parts for sale, same as this one. Claimed 30 day returns, claimed 12 month warranty. When it breaks, you're probably gonna end up throwing it away. Features, nice to have. It's very light. There was a gas lens included with the TIG torch. So this is, uh, I don't know if it's truly Pyrex, but this is a glass gas lens, which is, and it's giant. This is probably a number 16 or something gas lens. The point of a gas lens is to focus a column of shielding gas as opposed to a normal TIG torch cup like these that kind of shoots the gas out in like a turbulent cone. Whereas a gas lens focuses it into a near laminar flow, to use some nerd words. Point of that is you can have more tungsten stick out. It's gonna be more shielded, more effectively shielded. Uh, it's better when you're working with sensitive materials like stainless and titanium and stuff like that. Pretty nice inclusion, really, because nice gas lens kits can run you up to a hundred bucks or more if you get like a variety set or whatever. It came with a 26 series torch, a trigger, grounding clamp and the 110 to 220 volt adapter because this is a dual voltage machine. Also, I found out what these cup holder looking things are. They intend for you to wrap your wires around here. Oh. It seems obvious now, but I couldn't figure out what the hell they were for. Overall feeling conclusion, again, cheap, simple. It is handy. It's hard for me to be harsh on welders that are really small because they don't occupy a lot of space. You can easily forget about them in the back of your shop. And if you happen to need it, it's a good backup welder, field welder, doorstop, whatever you want to use it for. <laughs> it's basically disposable. I would almost guarantee that the power rating is overrated. It has no gas regulator, which to me is the biggest bummer of this whole welder. You cannot spend $205, get a bottle of gas and start welding. So that's kind of lame. And the torch is giant and heavy. I do not understand why they included a 26 series TIG torch. It is the biggest air-cooled TIG torch that exists. It's cumbersome. It is not a flex head. Well, kinda. Anyone can be a flex head if you try hard enough. I think a 17 series torch, I mean, here's the difference. The handle's way bigger. This is a WP17, likely for Miller. Yeah, 
Uh, this is much more easy to use and, and navigate than this one. So that was probably like, hey, we have a container of these torches, we're gonna send them. Yeah, those are the Vivor welders. They are what they are. Uh, also, one of the most hilarious owner's manuals that we've ever read. The broken English in here is some of my favorite I've ever seen. In any case, moving on. Are there any circumstances where you would choose those over any other welder in this lineup? There are no circumstances in which I would choose a Vivor welder over other welders in this lineup, other than the plastic welding. Um, we're about to get to some of my favorite welders I have. And for spending a little bit more money, you can get a machine that's way better, has actual quality parts and genuine service. Someone tells me this video is not going on the product page. Video. No, <laughs> listen, I've done Vivor all kinds of favors. I'm kind of, they can keep sending me stuff because they send it without requirements. I've gotten a lot of shit online for being a Chinese tool shill, and then I should be advertising for better tools but uh, I get to make decisions about what I do. <laughs> yeah. That's enough talking about Vivor. Let's move to a company that stands by completely different values, Miller. <laughs> this little welder has an interesting story. So this on paper, well, the paper that I folded up, is a Miller Maxstar 140 STR. It's from 2001, so it's the oldest welder I own. It used to belong to my late uncle Craig Hill, who was a hydraulic motion control engineer in Charlotte, North Carolina. One of the most talented craftsmen I know and an amazing, amazing dude in the trades and uh, super talented. This was his personal little DC TIG welder. I never saw him use it. I've never used it, but you know, when he passed, I'm the welder in the family, so I ended up with the welder. I think it's adorable. It's the smallest weld, well, it's a little, about the same size as this Vivor one, but it's about three times the density. It's way heavier, and you can tell there's some real quality parts and things in here. So what is it? This is a DC stick and DC TIG welder. There's no high frequency, it is all lift arc. Uh, you have to keep in mind, this is a 22 year old welder. So a high frequency start on TIG welders was a little bit more rare 20 years ago. It was around, but for the budget home gamer ones, like this thing has high frequency start, if that tells you where we've gone in, in 20 years. The original price, so far as I could tell, would have been a little north of $1,000 for this whole kit. And it comes with this really nice carrying case. The other ones just come with a cardboard box, really. It's intended to be mobile. A lot of people call these pocket rocket welders. You know, it's, it's, it actually originally had a strap where you could wear it on your, uh, on your shoulder. I would imagine field repairs, shipyard stuff where you're way deep into something maybe. Insert your application here, but super mobile welder, literally meant to be mobile and portable. The only modern comp I can find for this welder is the Miller Maxstar 161 STL, which sells for $2,285. So you can see in 20 years the inflation we've had in uh, welding prices, and that's pretty normal. Even two years ago, the Miller Multimatic 220 was like 3,000 and now, or $2,700, and now it's almost $4,000. That's the welder that uh, Jake bought over there. So yeah, something, something, supply chain, global crisis. Anyway, this thing will run off of 115 and 230 volts. At 115 volts, it will run at 80 amps peak with a five to 110 amp range. At 230 volts, it'll run at 100 amps from a five to 140 amp range. Duty cycle is 100% at 100 amps. That's on 230 volts and 60% at 100 amps on 115 volts. So already this thing is ready to work. A 100% duty cycle at any given value that is usable, this thing will hum all day long. Quality components on the inside, good ventilation, proper engineering. You get what you pay for. Complexity, learning curve. Again, I've not used this welder, so I can't speak totally to its uh, learning curve or complexity. I will say though, lift arc TIG does take some getting used to if you're used to a high frequency start. You know, lift arc, what is it? Well, not only is it the name of my company, but there's a reason. I thought it was a cool sounding welding term. But essentially lift arc is to start the arc, you will touch the electrode to the part, and then the arc is initiated once you lift the electrode off your part, hence lift arc. And then to stop it, you kind of just like sweep it away. It's a little messy stopping a weld arc on a TIG welder when you don't have a trigger, but it's certainly possible. So that's part of the learning curve for this thing. Uh, the gas flow is controlled by the torch, not the machine. So it does come with a regulator, 
But prior to welding, you just open this valve and you get the argon flowing out of the tip. Then you go to weld and it's just flowing argon until you're done and then you shut it off. Other than that, it seems very simple. There's one knob and one switch. The switch switches between stick and lift our TIG and the knob changes the amperage and there's two amperage ranges depending on whether you're running on 110 or 220. General TIG technique is part of the learning curve. Serviceability, it's a Miller, so one could assume parts are replaceable. Most welding repair shops will work on Miller welders. Uh, and the warranty, at least when it was purchased, was one year. So 20 years later, it's for sure out of warranty. But there are, if you buy a new one of this kind, obviously it'll come with a warranty. Features, nice to have. Again, it's super small and light. Miller has really nice quality TIG torches. They're really well made. Even the ones that aren't flex heads, you can bend just a little bit, just don't get into the habit of doing it. Just overall, really high quality stuff. Miller's always had really nice stock TIG torches. Most of them are made by, uh, well, I think Weldmark or Weldcraft later, but that's a Miller torch. And it comes with a regular and a carry case. So it is a turnkey welding machine other than a bottle of argon. Overall feeling, it seems like it would be a great name brand TIG welder to start on. Uh, in my opinion, I would rather have high frequency start on my first TIG welder because it's gonna make the learning curve a lot shallower. Lift arc is just a messy thing, but I guess it goes back to that thing where if you learn the hardest process first, then you get spoiled with features, you're gonna respect what those features mean. Kind of that whole, you're never gonna have a calculator when you leave school kind of thing. So that's, that's that. I just love having it. I don't know that I'll ever use it other than for fun, but uh, if nothing else, it's adorable and it looks cool on the shelf. Looks like Craig has also put some newfangled 220 volt capable. It's funny, on the back it says, install proper power cord for 230 volt use. So it's meant for dual voltage, but it's like, hey man, beef up the cord before you plug it into a 220 volt outlet. Now, the next welder is essentially a modern replica of this Miller welder. And that is the Everlast Power Arc 161 STH. This has quickly become my one of my favorite welders here because of feature density and price and just overall ease of use. This thing rules. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's a stick welder and DC only TIG. It will run on 110 and 220. This thing costs $488 on Amazon because this is the 2021 model. It has since been replaced with the PowerArc 160i STH that sells for even less, $399 on everlastgenerators.com. Same features. Pretty hard to beat that. This is that welder that the, uh, Oleg at Everlast said that we should have compared to this Vivor welder, not the PowerTig 210. He was like, that is not even at all an even comparison. Because his point was, this one is 200 something. This one's 400. As welders are concerned, it's not that big of a jump in price. And the benefits you get from a machine like this are exponential. Yeah, especially if you're spending hundreds on a regulator for that one. Right? Yeah, comes with a regulator. Uh, so power and whatnot, this runs at 80 amps on 110 volts, which is, or 90 amps, sorry, which is pretty impressive. And then 160 amp peak on 220 volts. Yeah, at 120 volts, it'll go down to 28 gauge steel and weld up to eighth inch steel on a single pass. 220 volts, it'll do the same minimum and a 3 16 maximum single pass DC TIG steel. That's pretty big. I mean, that does 90%, if not more, of the DC TIG welding I do in this shop. You know, if I'm welding much thicker stuff, personally, I tend to bias towards a MIG welder. So that's a pretty, this is likely the only TIG welder you'll need in your shop for steel, stainless, titanium, DC operations. Duty cycle on the 161 is 35%. When a manufacturer lists one number as a duty cycle, that usually means the highest input voltage option cranked all the way to the moon. So this thing will run at full tilt on 220 for 35% duty cycle. In other words, three and a half minutes in a 10 minute window. Complexity learning curve. It's a somewhat complicated interface. You do need to know TIG, for perspective, I learned how to TIG, well, to jump the gun, I learned how to TIG on this machine. I then bought the most complicated TIG welder I've ever owned, the 210 EXT, and then I got this. So after all of that, this was really simple for me, but if this is your first TIG welder, you're gonna need to know some things. As I've already covered, you're gonna wanna know what 2T and 4T means, you're gonna know what pulse means. 
Uh, you're gonna need to know about the different starting methods where it's lift arc versus high frequency. And the same for stick. So with MMA, uh, which is whatever the acronym is for stick welding. You're gonna wanna know what hot start means, arc force, uh, different types of electrodes, VRD mode, which is an electrical protect, electrically protected mode, stuff like that. that. Again, that goes with all of these. You're gonna wanna know some basic terminology so you know what all the buttons do. Everlast claims they have a five-year warranty, which means even my power TIG I bought three years ago is still apparently within warranty. I would like to pursue that and see just how accurate that is. But, you know, no local welding shops are gonna work on Everlast machines. They're not really designed to be, have the parts replaced. Although I have heard that if a board goes out, either one of the boards or the whole interior unit, again, allegedly will send you replacement parts. If you have the wherewithal to do the repair yourself. Again, in many cases, if you've made money with this machine for three, four years and you spent $400 on it, you're probably just gonna chuck it. I'm just being honest. Features nice to have. This is light. It did come with a carrying case. However crappy it might be, we have used it. Cut to the picture of Steve welding inside of a brewery tank across town. This is the machine we brought with us. And it's a crappy little blow molded carrying case, but it did come with it. And it actually came, everything does barely fit inside here. It does come with an included gas solenoid and regulator. So there's a solenoid in the machine that switches the gas on and off with the trigger. And it comes with Everlast's standard cheap but very effective argon regulator. Very stable arc. It feels very familiar to the 210 that I'm used to. It runs off a of 110 and it's green. I've come to really like Everlast's green. Overall feeling, I believe this is the best bang for the buck in a DC TIG welder, truly. This is the one I recommend anyone that asks me, I wanna get into TIG welding, where should I start? So long that you don't need AC aluminum welding capabilities. If you're only doing steel, it is extremely hard to beat $400 for a machine with this many features. And they didn't pay me to say that. I just can't believe you get this much welder in a $400 package. What'd you pay for your uh, Dynasty, Aaron, with the water cooler? Yeah. There's still that, if not more. Yeah, five to 10 grand for the top of the line dynasty where you can learn some real transferable skills on a machine like this and then upgrade if you so choose. It's just an incredible uh, place to start. It's rock solid. It's way better built by, than these Vivor welders. And I know that because I've picked them both up. <laughs> you can just tell that there's nicer components, bigger MOSFETs, bigger switches, and better wiring in a, in a welder like this. And that's worth something to me. You, you, you kind of just get a sense of how well things are made. All right, well, put this, put this wherever you want. But a lot of people complain about a brand name tax. I, I have to say it depends because I'll touch on this more when I get to my Miller MIG welder that I've had for 21 years and is still flawless. You really do get what you pay for within reason. I think the cost of certain brand name welders right now is kind of insane. And a lot of it does seem like it's getting marked up just because it's blue or red. And when you see something like this, that's still that good, it does make your hair stand up a little bit. So I'm not gonna give you the answer that you want on the subject of a brand name tax. I think both situations can be true. I think there are some brand name welders that are fairly priced given the durability, build quality, repairability, and overall feature set. Uh, but I also think there are some name brand welders that are extremely highly priced. Like the Miller, the Miller Dynasty 300 seems like it's priced, it's like at $9,000. And for a TIG welder that really doesn't offer you much more functionality than a welder that's like a quarter of the price, in my opinion, it does seem a little steep. So my answer on that is it depends. It, I can promise you that this Everlast welder is not built in Wisconsin, which is where Miller welders are built. I can promise you that. Back to the Everlast 161 STH. Definite step up from 99% of the cheap DC TIG welders on the market. This welder here, this Vivor thing, has been repackaged 400 times. This exact cheap and cheerful welder exists in 20 colors and 20 brand names and 20 different sites, wholesale online shopping sites. It's the same crap on the inside. I guarantee you 
most welders in this price bracket are made in a similar factory. I'm not saying this isn't, but this is a for sure step up from all these cheap and cheerful welders. Not to mention, I've spoken with the owner of Everlast on the phone, so that's a big thing. Like, they are accessible people. Uh, they're active on social media. They have a YouTube channel explaining how to use their welders. We are Vivor's YouTube channel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That means they are grabbing the lowest, <laughs> cheapest, easiest possible thing. Moving on to another sentimental welder in my lineup. This is the Eastwood TIG 200 AC-DC TIG welder and stick welder. It does stick, DC TIG, AC TIG. I bought this welder in 2016. It was my very first TIG welder, and when I got it and I used it, it was the very first time I had ever TIG welded, period. So this is the welder I learned to TIG weld on. I've owned it for, what is that, seven years? Back in 2016, I paid $744.21 to get this welder shipped to my door. Uh, it has since been, they don't sell this exact model anymore, but it has been upgraded and it sells for $7.99. So it's the same basic price bracket, 50 bucks more. And you get a much nicer foot pedal now than the ones you get before. Power amperage rated thickness. I pulled all of this from the old manuals that I found back in the day. This is a dual voltage machine. It runs off of 110 and 220. Uh, on 110, it goes from 10 to 145 amps. On 220, it goes from 10 to 200 amps. So the max is always usually in the name. It's a theoretical max. Again, it's kind of still a budget welder, so I'm curious if it even hits that 200 amp. But we've put this thing through hell, and it keeps coming back for more. It claims max 3 16 inch thickness on single pass DC TIG welding. Duty cycle on this is 60% across the board. So 60% at 145 amps with 120 and 60% at 190 amps on 220. So that's kind of, for price, the duty cycle fits right in between like the name brand stuff and the like cheap Vivor stuff. In everyday practical use, I find duty cycle to influence 0% of my welding journey. You just weld it until you're done. I mean, th theoretically, 60% duty cycle means you're welding for six minutes in a 10 minute window, straight, yeah. with no break. If you're TIG welding for six minutes, your hand is on fire, right? Yeah, water cooled. Go water cooled. Yeah. I'm I'm not bougie like Aaron. I I'd rather have 12 shitty air cooled tigs than one really nice water cooled tig. Complexity and learning curve. Extremely simple interface. This was an incredible first tig welder. It makes learning aluminum tig welding extremely easy. This is my first journey in all of tig welding. There's like four dials and three two switches. So you got power clearance, which is your AC balance pre and post flow. It's super rare to see two dials for pre and post flow now. And then a DC AC switch, and then foot pedal or panel control. Yet again, this is why I said this was an incredible machine to learn on because you almost can't mess it up as far as like dialing in the settings. You can for sure mess up the other parts, but not that part. This means that they've built in a lot of assumptions about how you're welding and what you're welding. Serviceability, this included a three-year warranty. Ow. You can get certain replacement parts from Eastwood, but only like triggers and foot pedals, like the stuff on the outside. I highly doubt, well, I tried to look for them and they don't exist. Interior replacement parts don't exist and a welding shop is going to laugh at you when they say, when you say, please help me fix my Eastwood TIG welder that is four years old. It's features and nice to have. It's extremely sense, uh, simple to use. It comes complete with foot pedal, gas uh, regulator, which is uh, over here for some reason. Eastwood's own cheap little regulator. Came with consumables, something similar to this, you know, basic set of cups and whatnot. This one Steve has outfitted with some stuff he stole from the Naval Shipyard back in the day. A super, super stubby gas lens kit and a retrofit trigger. Onboard gas solenoid inside, it'll, it'll turn the gas on and off with the trigger. Super stable arc and really good for beginners. This is one of the best. If you also want to do AC, this is the only other welder that I've used that I can safely recommend over this one. It's $300 more, but if you're doing uh, aluminum and mild steels, uh, it's kind of necessary. It was the one that got me started, so it'll always be special, and it's still kicking after seven years of near constant abuse. Uh, we used this at Black Dog for like three years, and if you've seen Black Dog's metal shop, it's a pretty grueling place for equipment to exist. <laughs> Can't say enough good things about Eastwood. Um, I think they, they provide a real nice product for budget beginners. And uh, go check it out.
I, I really do like this welder. I've moved on, it's, it, I like the added features of the ones I have now because I know more about TIG welding now, but this is an incredible place to start. If you want AC and DC and a beginner welder that's under $1,000, I'm sure there's others, but this is one that I've used that still works and Eastwood uh, isn't going anywhere from what I can tell, so it's a great welder. Okay, I've eaten lunch, so I'm fatter now. Moving on to the Weldmark MP200. This welder's got a fun little story too. This is the welder I won in a Google review competition uh, put on by Arc3, the best East Coast welding supply store there is, even though they haven't compensated me for my corporate shilling. <clears throat> this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Weldmark MP200. It is a true, this is the only true multi-process machine that I own. It is a stick welder, it is a lift arc DC TIG welder, and it is a MIG welder. It can also accept a spool gun. So you can MIG aluminum and steel, and you can TIG steel, and you can use a stick welder. It did not come with the TIG torch or any of that, but allegedly it can do it. Probably just like this with the gas being fed into the torch, but maybe not. This welder sells right now for $8.99. It used to sell for $9.99. So it's come down in price a little bit. It has a 30 to 90 amp range with a 140 amp peak at 110 volts. It's a multi-voltage welder, 110 and 220. And a 30 to 300 amp rating at 230 volts. And with at on 220 volts, it can MIG weld 5 16 steel on a single pass and 3 16 steel on a single pass on 110. Duty cycle is 40% at 90 amps on 120 volts and 20% at 200 amps on 220 volts. So this thing's got some chops. For the size, this is one of the most power dense MIG welders. Well, these two are close, but this is one of the most power dense MIG welders you can get. That is this light. This one's far heavier. I will say this is not, as far as complexity and learning curve is concerned, this is not the easiest welder to dial in. The numbers on the dial this is kind of weird. The numbers on the dial don't really correspond with the numbers in the chart. So the numbers on the chart refer to the analog numbers on the back plate, but there's digital readouts above these. So I'm a big fan of using charts that are included with welders. You might think that's lame and a beginner thing, but if some manufacturer has bothered to write out all the settings you should use given a certain wire thickness, metal thickness, and type of gas, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, it's a really good starting place. So I don't find myself looking at the digital readouts at all. I find myself looking at the numbers behind the dials. It's a very easy MIG welding operation once the settings are right. It's exactly like you'd expect it to work. There's no delay on the trigger. Uh, the torch is really small and light, which I have actually come to like a lot. You know, when you compare it to this, Everlast machine, which has the biggest torch of any MIG welder I have. It's uh, quite a bit different. And sometimes this is all you need. And if you're welding out of position, it's a lot nicer to have a small welder like that. This welder has the best owner's manual out of any of the welders I have. It is super comprehensive to the point where it explains different welding joints and different welding techniques and like uphill, downhill, how to bevel your metal, how to uh, do multi-pass stuff, different patterns of welding. Like this manual can almost teach you how to weld. I mean, torch angle, all kinds of stuff. It is an incredibly thorough owner's manual. Weldmark is an American company, so that helps a lot. Yeah, reading through this, I was, I never read the manual actually, so reading through it, I was pretty blown away with the comprehensiveness of it. That's huge, because sometimes you don't have YouTube or very good internet connection or the money to go, money or time to go to welding school. Pretty awesome thing to come with the welder. Serviceability. So this welder comes with a three-year warranty through Weldmark, but the most important thing regarding serviceability about this welder is that Arc3 is a Weldmark dealer. If you buy this welder through Arc3 or I would assume other welding places, but I can only speak for ARC-3. You bring it to them to get it fixed or get a replacement part for it. You don't have to box it up and send it to some mystery company. You can bring it to your local welding store and if 
while they most likely won't fix it in house, maybe they will, I don't know, don't quote me on that, but you can go directly to them to service it. It's, and for a cheap welder, it's pretty nice. You know, I, I, I do believe this is made overseas, but the fact that a small scale welding supply place will honor and help you get replacement parts is huge. I can't say the same for Everlast or Vivor or Eastwood. You know, you have to use the United States postal system to interact with those guys. So that's a huge benefit and a nice to have. Speaking of nice to haves, very simple to use, true multi-process. This is the only machine I have that will theoretically do TIG, MIG, and stick. Comes complete other than a TIG torch, has an onboard gas solenoid. It is very light and mobile. I have done lots of mobile MIG welding jobs with this machine. Very light, you know, I don't want to TIG everything. There are lots of times where I'm in the field and I want to just MIG things. This has traveled with me a lot. And given its size, again, it's one of the most powerful small form factor MIG welders that I have. Overall, it's a super capable machine. MIG is certainly its main function. I would say most of the research and thought put into this is on the MIG welding side of things. So really this is a MIG welder that happens to also be able to stick and TIG if you have to. Very well made, and again, ARC3 being able to service it is huge. Being that this is the first MIG welder, we can actually open it up and look at the internals. This has just a single feed roller, whereas certain some machines have dual feed rollers. They're rather small, but they are easy to change out. It, it came with several different rollers. You know, the roller has to correspond with the thickness of filler wire you're using, so you just swap that out. Really nice, you can't put the bigger rolls of uh, MIG wire in here, but you just put the next size down, which still gives you a lot of a lot of wire. This could very well be the only MIG welder you have in your shop, and you will be quite happy with that, I think, given, of course, the price point. So now that we've broken into MIG welders, it is time to talk about one of the latest additions to the shop, the one I reviewed while somewhat inebriated from local beer, which was a pretty fun video to film. This is the Everlast Cyclone 262. It is a stick welder and a MIG welder. It can also accept a spool gun for wire feed aluminum welding. It costs $1,300 from Everlast. So we're getting up there now. This is a, this is a serious investment now for most you know small form welding shops. It is a 220 volt only machine. So you are not getting 110 volt capabilities anymore. It has a 30 amp to 275 amp range and you can MIG weld up to 7 16 thick single pass on steel, which is almost a half of an inch. And you can go down to a minimum of 24 gauge steel. So big range there of wire fed welding thickness on steel. With the Parker Spool DSP 360 spool gun, you can weld a minimum of 14 gauge aluminum, a maximum of a quarter inch aluminum on a single pass, and 3 8 aluminum on multiple passes, with multiple passes. The duty cycle is 35% at full blast. So I'm sure there's a usable range uh, where the duty cycle is 100% and you don't even have to worry about it. This thing is a beast. There are very few cases where you're gonna need to let it rest. This thing goes hot, it goes hard, and it is a workhorse. Complexity and learning curve. Okay, Everlast isn't gonna like this, but the power set is a nice idea, but it doesn't work at all. This thing has Everlast's version of the auto set feature that the Miller machines come with, which is where you can just tell it your wire size and your material thickness and it's supposed to give you all the setup, all the settings for you, just based on those two pieces. I have found that it biases way too hot and I don't like it. This machine, I have, since we did the video of the unboxing, I've used this machine a lot more and I'll go into what I've learned about it. It's a far better machine than I originally thought. Like here again, I reviewed an Everlast machine before I truly knew how to use it, which Again, has landed me in some hot water. <laughs> uh, that machine, when I got it, didn't make any sense to me, but I didn't yet fully know how to use it. And I even went so far as to make an apology video because I just ran that thing over with a bus, metaphorically. So I'm careful not to insult a machine that might be user error, but the point of the power set is that you're not supposed to be an expert for it to work. And I know what a good MIG weld is supposed to feel like. I've been doing it for 16 years. The power set on this machine is just not there yet. Sorry. However, 
This welder does require a higher knowledge about MIG welding to set up right, being that you cannot rely on the power set. I said however as if it's about to get better, but it's not. <laughs> it does not come with a chart on voltage and or wire feed settings. So if you are new to MIG welding, you are going to have to find that information elsewhere. I've been doing this for, again, for a decade and a half, and I still had to go online and look up ideal settings when it came to voltage and wire feed speed, given a certain thickness of metal you're trying to weld. In fact, I have started, like I found that online, which is getting me really close. This is a chart from who knows where, but you know, you go to the type of gas, the type of filler, the size of the wire, thickness you're welding, and then you can, it gives you readouts for voltage and wire speed. These are a lot closer than the auto set stuff. And like all the other welders, or not all, but most MIG welders, I would have loved for them to include a settings chart on the welder somewhere because it's super helpful. They are quite confident in the power set and I think that's not good. So I have also started just a sheet where when I figure out settings for a given thickness of steel, I will write them down so that I don't have to guess or get it wrong in the future. If you use this machine every day, you're gonna learn. Like ask any guy who works, any guy or girl who works in a weld shop with a specific machine every day, they are gonna know every setting of that machine for every thickness of material that they use. I used to know it for the digital versions of the Miller Maddox we used at Black Dog, but I've since forgotten it because this one doesn't have digital readouts. We'll get into that second. The other thing about this is understanding inductance is key. Inductance is a setting that I've never had to dial in on a MIG welder. And on this welder, it's very important. So far as I went and printed out a sheet that tells you what inductance is. To put it simply, inductance changes the penetration and the size or the profile, cross-sectional profile of the weld bead and consequently the amount of spatter. Here it says it, it controls how fast the current rises to reach the amps that have been selected when short circuit welding. So to put that in super layman's terms, to get this thing to weld smooth like I was used to it welding, like I used to a MIG welder welding, I had to turn the inductance up. Once I figured that out, in fact, on the video where I reviewed it, I was complaining about the spatter and it was not smooth. That was because I didn't have the inductance set right. Once I dialed the inductance in, this thing is butter. We use this machine to do all those giant well, uh, railings that went out to the Smith Mountain Lake House. I put it in everyone's hand. They said it felt great, normal, smooth. So again, kind of crapping on the welder before I fully knew how to use it. But to start the unboxing experience, seeing auto set, power set, and then realizing that I have to essentially teach myself new elect electronic terms to like fully understand the welder, it was a little bit of a shock. Yeah, so it's like, here's a welder that does all the thinking for you, but the thinking is wrong, and there's new things you have to think about. That's right. Serviceability, same as any other Everlast stuff. Uh, Five-year warranty through Everlast. Local shops will not service the welder. You'll have to send it back to Everlast or contact their customer service. Their customer service is good, and everyone I've spoken to from Everlast is very kind. They can speak English very well, and... Um, they're a great, they're a great company run by genuinely good people, I believe. But, you know, other than them being prevalent on social media and on the phone, uh, most local welding shops won't service a green machine. Features, nice to have. This thing has a lot of power, more power than my go-to 212. This machine is very clearly meant to take on the Millermatic 252. So clearly, in fact, that they've named it the 262 because 10 more is better. Bigger number better, <laughs> yeah. bigger number better. It's so obvious. But the 252 is a hell of a MIG welder. It is what I would argue the industry standard for production MIG welding before you get into separate wire feeders and power sources. So this thing is a hot rod. It has, once you, once you understand the menu, you can customize every part of the welding experience. The gun itself, which is how I tend to like to evaluate MIG welders because that's what you're touching all day, feels really well made, it feels really durable. It's kind of enormous, like the distance between my hand and this makes for like a somewhat insulated experience. However, being, being that this thing gets so hot, I guess it's nice to have the heat way out there. And of course, you always end up just resting it on your hand anyway. So 
Not a very big deal. I do wish the cable was a little longer. I think it's only like 10 feet or so. And when I got this thing serviced by Arc three or a few years ago, I had them uh, put a longer torch on it. And that's a huge difference. Seems like a very versatile welder. People speak very highly of its stick welding capabilities too. So for most people, this is gonna be a shop staple if you go for it. Overall feeling conclusion, very powerful inverter machine. So that's the, all of these machines have been, well, I'm not sure about that one but all of these machines have been inverter machines versus transformer machines. You see a difference? The difference is size. <laughs> it's a different power technology. Uh, transformers are giant, heavy, layered metal and copper wire coils that generate the voltage and amperage necessary to weld. Whereas an inverter, I don't even know how they work. The point is they can be a lot smaller and achieve similar power profiles. So it's a really powerful inverter MIG. It's the most powerful MIG welder that I own. So you throw, you know, 045 wire in here, you can weld some serious stuff. So it's nice to have that power in the shop. The instructions are a little vague. All of Everlast instructions are kind of vague, but they have an incredible YouTube channel. So what they lack in paper instructions, they more than make up for in tutorials on their YouTube. And then even outside of Everlast stuff, there are people that create content about these welders, like us. Well, as I said, power set doesn't work. Spatters a lot until you understand inductance. Contact chips or tips are cheap, but it didn't come with many. In fact, I should explain. MIG welders have what's called contact tips, and they're very different kinds but the contact tip is the last thing the wire touches on the way out of the gun. It is this, it is a consumable, it is disposable, you go through them. The Everlast came with three tips, a 045, an 045, and an 035. I run 030 wire. So I don't really know why they gave me two 045s and only one 035. I, I don't know, the, there's, you can get a 10 pack of these for like six bucks. And so why they didn't include one for every thickness of wire that typically you run in a MIG was a little weird, specifically because I can't go to Arc3 and buy these. I have to order them from Everlast or Amazon via Everlast. But it did come with its own wrench and it came with a lot of different roller options for the MIG wire. However, all the rollers have metric measurements on them in millimeters, 1.6, 1.2. In America, all the welding wire you buy is in inches. 023, 030, 035. So you just gotta, you know, convert, do a little math. It's not like a one-to-one, -one, you know, but as a welder in America, it was, you know, a little weird. But that's it. So that's the Everlast I will show you inside. This welder is extremely heavy given its size. What I do enjoy about the feed system is that it has two rollers that are gear driven by a middle roller. So you have twice as much contact surface pushing the wire through. The feed system is very smooth and you can put much bigger spools of wire in here. This is the biggest size you can put in this one. Here you can obviously see you can step up. So this can be your full-time big boy MIG welder. Aaron loves MIG welders. <laughs> I mean, to get this welder from Miller in the form of the Millermatic 252, you're paying three grand, if not more. So is a little bit of menu fiddling worth the savings? I would say yes, personally. If you can't spend 3,500 bucks on a welder yet, go for this thing. This is, I think, above what most hobbyists need for a MIG welder. You know, if you're looking to push your shop hard, work on some thick stuff, do some big boy projects, it's a really good option for the price. Again, 1,300 bucks, it's kind of hard to beat. There's just the raw power for that price. Pretty impressive. Dude, if you're in Roanoke and you want a nice refreshing drink, definitely check out the potion bar at Hustle Haven. Hustle Haven, we've got potions and so much more. <laughs> a haven from your daily hustle. Uh, this is like charcoal lemonade and it's delicious. And it does it clean you out? Sure, but it's also really dirty in here so you can't tell. <laughs> There's a hole in my straw. Is this the kind of company you guys are running? They are. Um, this place sucks. Yeah, they are recyclable straws. They are purely off. Turtles don't really care. <laughs> well, they can't care when they're dead. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely check out Hustle. They'll make you sweat more than you've ever sweat in your life. We are now going to move on to my favorite <laughs> welder of all time, and the only welder that works well as a chair, <laughs> the Millermatic 212. This welder has helped start two businesses. 
here in Roanoke. This is the first MIG welder that my dad bought when he started Black Dog Salvage, and it is the first MIG welder that I had here in the shop when I started Lift Arc Studios. This welder is 22 years old. It was purchased new in 2001 by my father, Mike Whiteside, and being that it's so old, the best I could do was use a site called the Wayback Machine, which allows you to see what websites used to look like in previous dates. Using the archive website online, I found a welding supply website from 2001 with this listing. So back at 02 or 01, this costs roughly $1,200 to $1,500. It's 21 years old, a new Millermatic 211, which is now an inverter machine, so I priced the new 211 with the cylinder rack so that it's functionally the same as this one. Cost $2,205. So it's honestly still pretty affordable for what it is. And that's from bakersgas.com. Sorry, I'm distracted by how good this lemonade is. It's a MIG welder, DC MIG welder, uh, can accept the spool gun, which for a 21-year-old welder is pretty impressive. It is only 220 volts. It has a range of 30 amps, 210 amps. And I believe this welder when they say it can go to 210 amps. It's a 212. They're even being modest. They don't even say it goes as high as the model number. It will weld 3 8 inch steel with a single pass with 035 or 045 wire and go down to 22 gauge steel if you put 023 wire in it. So not the most powerful welder, but how often are you welding 3 8 steel? I shouldn't say you, I should say me. We do not weld 3 8 steel very often at all. And to be honest with you, I've done it with this machine because if you chamfer right and do multiple passes, it's just fine. Quarter inch is about as thick as it gets on the day to day here at Lift Arc, and this welder loves it. For our purposes, it's still super usable. Duty cycle, here again, at full blast, 210 amps, it's 30%, 160 amps, it's 60%, and at 125 amps, 100%. Run all day long. So this welder, I don't ever consider this welder's feelings. I just turn it on and abuse it as much as I possibly want to, and it keeps coming back for more, and it never hiccups. When I saw this, I was kind of surprised because it was lower than I would have expected because this thing never coughs. Complexity, learning curve. One of the most simple MIG welders I've ever used. There are two dials, and that's it. There is wire speed, and there is voltage. And there is a chart to tell you how to move them around. That's it. <laughs> no screens, no numbers, nothing. And it is bang on. This is what, this is the welder that made me trust or want to trust these charts because this one is perfect. I set it to what it says I should set it at for that thickness and that wire, smooth as butter. Serviceability, again, with Miller, it doesn't get better. Uh, one to five year warranty depending on the part. I will say, Miller's warranty is kind of dumb now. So the most expensive and complicated parts of the welder, they usually only offer a one-year warranty. And as the part gets cheaper and less important, the warranty goes up. I bought this torch for my welder a few years ago. Again, you can still get new parts for a 21-year-old welder. The trigger stopped working less than a year, or just about a year in. And that is the extent, even though this thing said it had a three-year warranty on it, on the trigger, only had a one year warranty. It's like a $40 part and you couldn't, I had to buy a trigger outright on a year old torch. That was kind of dumb. However, Miller's warranty is the most transparent out of all of these. I'd be willing to bet that once you dig into most of these machines warranty, you'll probably be let down by something because <laughs> warranties are just that way. But most, if not all welding repair shops will work on this welder, even still today. I've had the main board replaced in this welder the torch replaced, the liner replaced, the rollers replaced, the gas solenoid replaced, the ground cable replaced, and I'm about to need to replace the fan, but I know I'm gonna be able to. Like they still make parts for it and welding shops will work on it just for you. And, and of course you can buy replacement parts probably anywhere and do it yourself if you want to. Features and nice to haves, again, most parts are replaceable. It's super consistent. This is the smoothest MIG arc uh, sound of any welder in here. There's sort of a running joke especially because Steve has struggled so much with his cheap little Lincoln MIG welder that a lot of MIG welders can do the job, but like when you hear a Miller, you kind of know it, you know? Like it's one of, if you've spent a lot of time welding or around any machine really, you kind of, you can listen to it and know if it's running well or not. With MIG welding, it's either smooth, it should sound like you're frying bacon. 
and if it's not working, it'll be popping and crackling and doing all kinds of stuff. This is the most consistent, smoothest MIG welder that I've ever used. I understand that other machines can be set, dialed in, figure it out. You use the chart settings on this, go to town, you're cruising, man. So overall feeling, th this is a really special welder to me. Again, it helped me start my business and it's still my go-to MIG welder here in the shop. It's rock solid, extremely serviceable, accurate power figures, and uh, it's a recognized brand. And I put in Taken seriously, there's something I can't quite explain that makes me feel good about having a really big blue box in my shop. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's like in the film industry when you see big cameras with long lenses. It, seem, it seems like a serious camera and they are to be taken seriously versus like a little handheld mirrorless camera. Inverter machines are pretty powerful, but there's something to be said about a big transformer machine that sits there and hums and takes your all day long. I'll show you around this machine. Of course you have the front on the inside, giant spool of wire, real simple and durable wire feed system. This is full of dust because I think we blew a bunch of dust in here the other day. There's really nothing going on in here. Wire, feed system, tension adjustment, and that's it. And like I said, I was still able to buy a new torch for an old welder, slotted right in, no dramas. This weld can also handily without putting it on a cart, can handle a giant tank of argon. Most of these inverter machines are so small that they are sold without carts or wheels or bottle carrying capabilities. These big welders come ready to rock on wheels, able to hold a uh, tank of argon and a full size tank at that. Any questions? Two, two last silly ones. Yeah. If somebody were to buy this exact machine used today, like if you were oh, to used? Around, if you were to turn around and sell this machine, well, if you can find one, yeah, right. that's the problem. Like most people like myself that have a welder like this are gonna take it to their grave with them. <laughs> one of these would probably sell used for, I'd say 1500 bucks is a fair price. It was held up value. Mm -hmm. This is like the Toyota of welders, you know, like depending on features, it may even stay exactly the same. That almost answers my follow up. Is there anything that would, that would move you to, to just water? I mean, it has to be simplicity. Like if the power set on that thing worked the way it was intended, I think I would think much more highly of that welder than, than, this, than I do now. Because MIG welding at this point is a pretty old process and there's no reason it should be very complicated. And so a machine that is 22 years old and still makes MIG welding about as easy as it can possibly get that's a hard machine to replace. There's certain things about that machine that I feel like they've overcomplicated. This is 0.01% of the welders that are out in the world. So it's hard for me to commentate on what I would replace this with that makes me feel the same. I'm sure there's something out there. All right, so last but certainly not least is the Everlast PowerTig 210 EXT. This is the second TIG welder that I bought with my own money and it was a significant leap, not only in cost but in feature set from the Eastwood <laughs> TIG 200. And this is around the same power figure but much more capable. I bought this after I realized that a Miller Dynasty is too expensive for me if I'm being completely honest with you. This is a stick welder, DC TIG, and AC TIG. It cost $1,569. I paid a total of $2,340 because I got a, well, that cart with it, a several torches, a nice foot pedal. I wanted like a turnkey, ready to go situation. I have a lot of power figures here. So it runs off of 110 and 220. From 110, you can go from three amps to 125 amps. So actually being able to go so low on the amperage range is really, I think, important on a TIG welder because TIG is often used for much thinner metal applications like sheet metal on cars, body work, delicate things. Um, so being able to actually establish a stable arc down around five, 10 amps is um, impressive. It says a lot about the high frequency start capabilities of this machine. On 220, you get from two to two, 210 amps. You can weld five sixteenths on a single pass on 220, quarter to three eighths aluminum on a single pass on 220. You can weld uh, three sixteenths single pass steel on 110 and quarter to three eighths aluminum single pass on 110. So if you notice, they claim the aluminum welding capabilities are the same regardless of input voltage. 
And either that's a lie or that's in reference to the fact that aluminum is welded with AC. So AC welding takes a little less horsepower than DC welding. For those of you out there alternating direct current, if you really wanna get deep into the Edison versus Westinghouse Nikola Tesla story, AC alternating current is much more capable of transmitting quote unquote power long distances. It's more efficient. If we are to use the garden hose metaphor, which is not a great metaphor for explaining electricity, but it's often the most, the easiest to understand. DC is like a garden hose. The further you need to push those electrons, the more power it's gonna take at the source. Whereas AC, you envision that hose is already full of water and you start, pardon the terminology, sucking and blowing over and over on the end, you're just moving that column of water around like this. So you're not constantly having to put effort into the hose to push the water up the hill to perpetuate the metaphor. Which is why my theory about what, um, I'm using that basic knowledge of AC versus DC to help rationalize why they may have claimed you can effectively weld the same thickness of aluminum regardless of input voltage because AC is more efficient at transmitting power. Whew. Gotcha. Feel free to rip me apart in the comments, everybody. <laughs> so duty cycle on this thing is 60%. Uh, that's wide open throttle. So this is a welder that even now Aaron can attest to. It doesn't argue with you very much. It will sit there and run. This thing takes a punch, it keeps coming back. Duty cycle seems to be irrelevant. I have, however, noticed a little bit of a fall off when welding aluminum, thick aluminum. For whatever reason, that's when I can notice the duty cycle is relevant. I do need to let this thing rest in between sessions, longer sessions of aluminum welding. Complexity and learning curve. This is a very complex and comprehensive TIG, weld, TIG welder. It takes a decent knowledge of TIG welding parameters and some metallurgy to understand how to change and why to change a lot of these settings. Going from that Eastwood to this Everlast was really hard for me. And AC balance on this machine is backward from what I'm going to call industry standard. I'll do my best to explain all that. So if you look at the front of the machine, there are some common things and some uncommon things. So starting with common things, you've got a three digit readout that is likely gonna tell you a numeric version of whatever setting you're changing. You've got uh, three different AC waveforms. I'm not quite smart enough to tell you the difference between the AC waveforms. I'll allow our smart commenters and patrons to tell you down below. I just leave it on advanced square, or you, that's where you select DC. Again, you've got 2T, 4T, and a pedal function. You've got a TIG pulse. You can pulse in DC and AC. So this is the first machine I got where I uh, the, had a feature where you could turn on a pulse while AC welding, which is odd because AC by, by default, because it's alternating current is already quote unquote pulsing at 60, 100, 120, 200 times a second. But then that can also pulse. It's a little advanced maybe for this video, but I'm saying it anyway. And then you've got what has become a pretty industry standard way to visually represent what's happening with the with the arc, sort of a pictogram here. You've got pre-flow, your start amps, your upslope, welding amps. If you turn the pulser on, this is the setting that changes that. Pulse time on, pulse amps, pulse frequency. Uh, if you're doing AC, this is your AC balance and AC frequency settings. And then you've got a downslope, end amps, post flow. So real quickly, pre-flow is the amount of gas that flows out of the torch before the arc is struck. Oftentimes that is established just to displace any atmosphere air prior to welding. You've got your start amps, that is the floor. So that is the amperage that, if you're using a pedal, that is the bottom of the welding range. Uh, if you're doing an upslope, that is where it will start and the upslope will last as long as you'd like it to. And then it will land at your set ceiling for welding amps. And then same opposite downslope, end amps, post slope. Uh, over here, you can change high frequency TIG or lift arc TIG or set it up for stick welding. Here's your cycle button. So this button cycles through all the settings. You just keep pushing it. Your main dial for changing things. Also on Everlast machines, the other TIGs, it seems as though their dials are set up the same way. So just turning it moves it by an increment of one. If you push in and turn it, it moves it by an increment of 10. Bunch of settings over here for stick. My favorite setting on this machine is the gas purge button. So you can, instead of having to click the trigger to 
get the gas flowing in order to dial in uh, your flow rate, you can hit this button, the gas will flow for as long as it's pressed or until you press it again. And it allows you to get up, dial in your flow on your regulator and then just stop it. It also allows you to purge your line if you haven't, if you just hooked up a new torch or whatever. And there's no danger of striking an arc accidentally. And then memory, you have uh, eight or nine programs you can set up here. So you dial in all your settings for something. Let's say it took you a while specifically to get something just right. This is just like a car radio. You get it to the number you wanna save it at, you long press the button, it'll flash, and then your preset is saved. So I have one in here for most AC welding with a pedal. I have a pulse setting for like roll cages and stuff. I have a thin DC constant amperage setting. Gives me good starting points now that I've kind of trained it up and I can just go from there. So you can see how much more advanced this is than the Eastwood. The learning curve was quite steep. Uh, especially because I refuse to ask anyone or read the instructions. The torches it came with were okay. My favorite torch was one I bought from CK Worldwide, which is a flex head. Does exactly what you would think it does. And I keep a gas lens on it of some sort, whether it's a number eight like this or a number 12, if I'm doing stainless or sensitive materials. Really still using the, the trigger it came with. Although I'm really excited to try out Joe's new TIG button, pressure sensitive button, which hopefully will be a hand control that I enjoy using. Gosh, I think that's it. I'm tired. <laughs> that is every welder that I own at the time of filming. There's not a whole lot of fat to trim in my mind yet. These two welders don't do much for me. I know that's gonna be a surprise to hear. This one's cool to have around, but it, you know, I don't use it. Now that Aaron is here, Aaron is a damn talented TIG welder. So I actually have a justifiable use for two good DC TIG machines. So he's been using that one and I have found myself using this one a lot more. So it's nice to have another TIG machine that I can lean on pretty heavily. And um, yeah, what do you think of the Power TIG like 210? Uh, what do you think of the Power TIG 210? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> it's talk back is so minimal. No, it's great, it's great. Um, Cause you're a Miller Dynasty guy. I am, I am. And I kind of want to bring it down just so we can have a side by side. We should have a drag race. We should, we should. Whatever that means uh, in welder terms. <laughs> we just, we weld and drag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> so. This welder, to continue where I was going with this, this welder uh, Steve uses because his Lincoln TIG died on him and is now no better than a doorstop. This welder, if I have to do mobile MIG welding, I will still use this one. It's great. And actually, I can fit all of the parts inside here. So storage-wise, this is a really neat package. This guy is on reserve for the muscle or if there's just two people MIG welding at the same time. It does live on a cart, it stays ready to go. I hope that my criticism doesn't seem unfair, but I'm being honest and um, sue me. This will continue to be my main go-to MIG welder because of what it means to me, how easy it is, how little I have to think, and just to how good of a welder it is, honestly. Gosh, I would love to talk to somebody from Miller about what's out there in this same realm that would make me feel the same as this one does and see if they've kept their quality up because this thing's gonna last another 20 years, no question. And this thing, what can I say about this welder? This thing is awesome. I've done roll cages and aluminum awnings and really sensitive stuff. TIG brazing, silicon bronze brazing, it's great. That's one of the best purchases I made for this shop, I think, in the welders. That's the rundown, that's it. I hope you enjoyed all the research I put into this. I feel like we've done a lot of half-ass welder reviews around here, so I wanted to give this one some ferocity and completionarianism. Goodbye. Up words. <laughs> yeah, I'm just making up words. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, I appreciate you all. The most recent video as of the time of filming is doing quite well, and that's the video about the air system we redid in the shop, so I appreciate all of those that are watching that video. We've had a lot of requests for this video, so hopefully you've enjoyed, and if you stuck around this long, it's likely that either you are subscribed or you would greatly benefit from being subscribed. So I really appreciate you guys. Check out the Patreon. Uh, we got a lot of cool people signing up and a lot of neat conversations happening as a result on the Discord server. You, even the most entry-level patrons get access to our Discord. It is a way to communicate reliably and as frequently as possible with us, and you can ask us questions about the stuff we do on and off the camera. So appreciate you guys. 
go buy a welder, go weld. It's a, a damn rewarding thing to learn how to do and you won't regret it. Shout out to all these companies and the blood they have allowed me to let on camera. <laughs> or not known that, Yeah. never mind. My lawyer has in, instructed me to plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you